in Alaska. I can't imagine my life without a connection to the mountains. And much of what I've experienced, in fact, what all skiers and snowboarders have experienced, is owed to an unlikely group of men, a band of brothers who literally put skiing on the map. This is their story. Sometimes to learn the greatest thing about the present, you gotta step back to the past. In the mountains, in the woods, we take our chances with anyone. It was different. Military skiing was entirely different than what I pictured it. If you think of a mountaineer, you think of a character. You were with a group of people that had that tendency. And there are some days, you know, it, it was so beautiful, so inviting. We just take off. These guys were not only fun-loving, but man, they were tough. We were there because we wanted to be there. And I thought they were going to kill us all off. Just keep your heads and remember your instructions. We paid a very, very severe price for the number of months we were in battle against the Germans. A thousand were killed and 4,000 more were wounded. The greatest blessing that came out of the 10th for many of us was the great common love of the mountains. And it became the lives of most of us. The grandeur of the mountains, was, it just gradually seeped into my body and uh, I knew that this was uh, something that I was going to enjoy for the rest of my life. These guys are not only war heroes, but to me, heroes in the ski industry. We sort of are the fathers of the modern ski industry. The band of brothers, <laughs> we were part of that. The 10th Mountain Division. 10th Mountain Division, 10th Mountain Division, 10th Mountain Division. Professional skier and guide Chris Anthony grew up in the shadows of the tent. Living in the Vail Valley in Colorado, you hear about this 10th Mountain Division, you see these tributes all over, the statues, and it just made me that much more intrigued to find out who they are and the personalities of each and every one of them. And selfishly, I get to ski some pretty fun terrain because what they did to defend our country. The origin of the 10th Mountain Division dates back to the year 1940. World War II was raging in Europe as Adolf Hitler led Nazi Germany and their allies on a massive offensive. The United States would not join the war until 1941, after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. But many influential Americans were already well aware of the danger Hitler and his allies posed, including one New Englander named Charles Minnie Dole, who had founded the National Ski Patrol in 1938. Dole had taken notice of accounts detailing how a small unit of Finnish mountain troopers, allies of Germany, had annihilated a superior-sized Soviet Army division during a fierce mountain battle. Dole's fear was that if the U.S. didn't take action to develop our own mountain unit, our enemies would have the same upper hand if we fought in the harsh mountainous terrain of Europe. The Germans, the Italians, had many mountain divisions. We didn't have any. And so this seemed to be a very sensible way to train troops to be able to fight in Europe, where you've got the Apennines and you've got the Alps. After months of hard selling his idea to the War Department, Dole finally convinced them to take action in 1941. President Franklin D. Roosevelt commissioned the 10th Mountain Division, and he put Charles Dole in charge of recruiting soldiers. Unlike any other U.S. military unit, it would be made up entirely of volunteers. 
the only requirement, three letters of recommendation, and of course, a love for snow and mountains didn't hurt either. I uh, belong to a ski club in uh, Portland, and also I was on the high school ski team. And so the word got out that they were starting on a 10th Mountain Division ski troops. And uh, I thought, uh, hey, that sounds interesting. To ski during the war. <laughs> I said, uh, I'm going to join the Navy. And my professor he shook his finger at me and he said, you're going to the mountain troops. He says, you're a skier. I was at Exeter in New Hampshire as in school, and I've been with the Sierra Club there and skied with the Sierra Club and climbed with the Sierra Club. To tell the truth, I thought that Hitler and the, and the Japanese, you know, we wouldn't have to worry about them as Americans until Pearl Harbor. That's when I woke up and realized that you can't survive in this world with tyrants like that. So I was very much into trying to defeat the Nazi and the Japanese. And uh, the uh, mountain troops seemed like a good way to go about it. When the uh, idea of the mountain troops came up, I was head of the ski patrol of Sun Valley, Idaho. I ended up in I Company, 87th. My brother ended up in K Company, which was right next door. We were pretty knowledgeable of snow and cold weather, having been born and brought up on a farm in northern New Hampshire. So to us, cold weather and uh, snow was second nature. I mean, it, we expected it every winter, cold and hot. A friend of mine said, if you have the chance, he's sure enjoying this outfit. He says, it's one big country club out here. All it lacks is the hot buttered rum. So, uh, of course, I was very enthusiastic. I was working in the Grand Teton National Park and learned through the American Alpine Club that this unit was being created and I couldn't get into it fast enough. The enlistments came primarily out of the Ivy League universities of New England and out of the Midwest, particularly Minnesota, the Norwegians in particular. The recruiting took place among men who were skiers and mountaineers. All the volunteers joined in the unit because they wanted to be in it. They wanted to be with other mountain men, other skiers, and so forth. The result was we had perhaps the finest morale unit in the entire army. We were there because we wanted to be there. My Uncle Jimmy was a captain in the 10th Mountain Infantry, and uh, he was already a commissioned officer from uh, Northwestern Military Academy. And so when the war broke out, he naturally volunteered. He had a very successful business going. He had a wife. He really didn't have to go, but it was everybody's duty at that time to do your part. And uh, he being a skier and uh, having the love for mountains, he was naturally drawn to become a 10th mountain soldier. My father, Ben, did, he went to high school in Chicago, then went on to college, Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And Williams had a ski racing team, I think he was involved in the ski club there. And when the war broke out, the 10th Mountain Division basically recruited guys in those New England schools. My dad, Pete Severd, was in the 10th Mountain Division. You know, my dad was uh, incredibly gregarious. He was the center of things, you know, whenever he walked in a room, you hear that about a lot of big characters in life, and he was certainly one of them. You know, these guys came together for a common purpose to win the war, but they also had the camaraderie and, you know, the same love of skiing and mountains. I think a lot of these guys actually wanted to go to camp and just hang out with their buddies in the mountains. They really wanted to be here. By the spring of 1942, high in the Colorado Rockies, construction was underway on Camp Hill. Here, the true story of the 10th soldiers would begin to unfold. How they lived, how they trained, and how one day they would have an impact on the world. The reason that Camp Hill was selected at 9,200 feet 
in Tennessee pass, you were at 10,000, was you had six month winters. And so uh, it became a most important part of, of our existence, really, as we trained for what we were going to face later on. I got on the train in Pueblo and went up through uh, the, uh, the canyon, and then I saw White Camp Mountains in the background. I knew that I was headed for snow country. These 10th Mount recruits might have been headed for snow country, but they weren't necessarily equipped for the conditions they would encounter. Okay, here enough. My army issued 1942 fatigues. To get a sense of what it was like for the men of the 10th Mountain Division, professional skier and longtime tent enthusiast Chris Anthony decided to visit Camp Hale and take a step back in time. I'm guilty of this, and I know everybody's guilty of this. They look at an old picture, or they look at an old video, they look at old Warren Miller stuff, and they go, oh, those guys look so geeky, and they can't ski that well. Well, I tell you what, take a step back in time, and actually go out and put on that equipment. Step into the shoes of what those men were utilizing back then, and it'll put everything in perspective. This just goes to show how tough these guys were. I'm wearing modern stuff underneath. And Chris wasn't alone. He invited two of his buddies, Tony Seibert and Scott Kennett, both world-class skiers and descendants of 10th Mountain Soldiers. Some new boots. Some super sick goggles. You know, just taking everything out and seeing what they used to wear and everything was really cool. The first time I put all the 10th Mountain gear on, we were actually in Camp Hale, and we were on the old roads that those guys drove into Camp Hale and marched on and did all that. And we put the ski camouflage on, the boots, the gloves, the goggles, the hats, everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was amazing that they even used this stuff. And it literally, you know, looking around where I was with that gear on, knowing my uncle was here, Back in you know the 1940s, doing the exact same thing, it, it brought goosebumps to me. Yeah, it was really cool. I mean, um, when my grandpa was there in the same gear, the same skis, in the same area, and uh, it was actually like being back in time. And you got a really good feeling for what it was like to be a tenth mountain trooper. Now comes the hardest and most important part: downhill. All right, man, watch your skis. Where we are is what was called Cooper Hill, and it was built so that the units of the division could be brought up here 400 at a time and given ski training on this hill. There were barracks just below, and it was a two-week type of special training time. Then back to Camp Hill, and 400 more would come up. And over a period of the first winter, in which was the winter of 1942-43, there were about 8,000 men uh, uh, brought up here for ski training. The United States Army had never had mountain and winter warfare trained troops prior to the creation of the 10th Mountain Division. So we were brand new. We were a new experiment. So absolutely everything had to be new, tested, developed. I helped unload a truck full of those long white sticks and some guys even call them skis. <laughs> they were state-of-the-art skis at that time. And there were two lengths, seven foot two, seven foot six, if I remember correctly. This is one method of determining the correct length of the ski. By placing the tip at the palm of a man's hand with his arm extended over his head. For example, you're about six foot tall, average weight. We'll take a seven foot two ski. The binding had to be one binding a binding that would be good for downhill, and a binding that you could do cross-country on. This gives the foot ample freedom to work the ski and lengthen the stride. The cable around a notch in the loop, and then lugs on the side where you could change the binding cable, and that would permit the heel to come up for cross-country or be locked down for downhill. Well, that's enough for now. Better turn in and get a good night's rest. Tomorrow morning, the ski instructor will start your actual ski lessons. And good All of the rest of the equipment that we had was literally developed for us during the time we were at Camp Hale. 
and everything that was developed weighed 118 pounds. I weighed 118 pounds. <laughs> they said if I put a pack on, I couldn't get off the floor. The basic movements of skiing were taught, period. That was it. And how to handle the extra weight of a pack and a rifle. Particularly that rifle swinging around on your back. And it was practiced. <laughs> Day in and day out. The whole skiing technique learned was the body erect right over the skis and not letting a shoulder go down on either side. But getting used to doing that, you had to have that weight on your back. I was a, at that time a lieutenant, pulled an inspection of a unit one time and found the rucksacks were all filled with pillows. <laughs> the soldier learns fast. <laughs> that was very hard work. You didn't have green slopes. You had crusted or deep powder. You were skiing in the trees. You were carrying 90 pounds of rucksack. You were carrying what you needed to survive in the winter in these forests and these mountains. Well, the only thing was to get down. Get down. No matter how you get it down, it's fine. <laughs> It um, actually fit really well. I, it almost has the same cut as a nice baggy snowboarder line these days. But the canvas that was being utilized for the material was very heavy. It absorbed a lot of water, but it somehow kept it warm. That was the whole philosophy back then, that the material could get wet but stay warm. I kind of really got into how the gear worked and understood that the boots weren't just for skiing. They needed to be used for mountaineering, they need to use, be used for snowshoeing, as well as cross-country skiing and downhill skiing. So I kind of understood why the boot was made like it was. They were supposed to be able to move through the woods, in the snow, towards the enemy. And that means either going uphill or downhill. So going uphill, you need to use the skis as more of a snowshoe and be able to walk up the hill. So the bindings that they designed were evolutionary. They made a binding that could unlock and walk up the hill, and then walk, and they could ski down the hill. And today we call that AT gear. Imagine skiing with the equivalent to about 90 pounds of gear on a backpack, and it's not a modern backpack. It's pretty flimsy, and it slides around and slides forward. The bindings don't release. The skis are long and straight, and once things start going wrong, it just compiles and down you go. Holy cow. I mean, if you get a little bit forward, you're gone. If you get just a tiny bit back, you're gone. And then the skis just don't want to turn. How did they do it? I can't believe it. Much, much respect for these guys. You know, in this stuff. I looked at these guys in the old vintage footage and you're thinking, oh, no problem. They just start cruising along, making this look so easy. And I put on the gear. Granted, my boots are like four sizes too big, but the worst part is there's no ankle support, so you have no fore or back aft. You're just kind of sitting there center, trying to uh, maintain balance. Just can't believe how good they are. And the fact that they left the ground with these on just blows my mind. I wouldn't even think about getting an inch of air. Whichever way you want, whichever way the snow's gonna take you, you're going. So. They made it look easy. Total respect. They're crazy. A lot of props to them. A lot of what they did was kind of come in here blindly and, and learn all this stuff, you know? The stuff that we take for granted today, they were pretty much figuring it out for the first time on, you know, how the ski gear worked and how the skins worked and how the bindings worked and the boots and all that. It's kind of neat to put on this old gear and, and uh, 
just today I was kind of staring down at my boot as I was lacing it up and just thinking about, you know, those guys. We put on our boots to train for competitions. They're putting on their boots to train to go to war and uh, kind of really made a, an impact with me. When people read about the 10th Mountain, you hear about the best alpinists in the country were brought in to train people and often served. They were the lieutenants and the captains of the division. But the 10th Mountain recruited cowboys, they recruited ranch hands, guys digging ditches, U.S. Forest Service workers, and all these people who loved the outdoors but they didn't know a fig about skiing. These guys were learning from the best alpinists of the time, but if you've never been on a pair of skis before and you got a cowboy hat and you've been riding a horse, that's got to be funny. I, mean, I, I can only imagine what it was like there. We, we would be absolutely no threat to the enemy. <laughs> they would see this coming. <laughs> they would just keel over in hysterics. <laughs> I'm going to have to call up my gun and shoot myself. <laughs> I wouldn't need those three letters of recommendation. <laughs> they wouldn't know that forge mine for sure. We had some good times skiing, but some real hard times too. We didn't know what to expect. I didn't. By 1943, nearly 14,000 men were training at Camp Hale. And it wasn't just the skiing that was tough. It was all about surviving in the mountains in winter. Well, the course D series was the big deal there. That was a long battle against an enemy. And it happened to come in extremely cold weather. I thought they were gonna kill us all off. Sleeping out and temperatures down to 30 below zero without a tent. If you put up a tent, the tents we had, you perspire and it freezes on the tent. You bump the tent and it all goes down your neck. So we learned to sleep out without tents. We slept on top of our skis. We learned the tricks of the trade to survive. Really, it was a survival exercise. One night, I was so cold in my boots and socks were frozen, I couldn't get my boots off, and my socks were frozen to my feet because of moisture, so I stayed up all night moving to keep from freezing, and terrible experience. They all say, what's up, soldier? This may mean your life. You know, well, God, you hear that all the time, well, everything but would mean, mean your life there. Well, winter camping, I mean, if you don't have all your equipment, all your sleeping set up right, you're gonna have a miserable, long, cold night and not get a lot of sleep. And then these guys were up early, had to go train all day or go fight all day. And uh, back into that same setup with frozen boots and wet socks, and you don't have your latest, greatest poly pro that dries quick and, you know, it was tough. The trick that I think we've learned is you have to stay cold because when you were moving with the pack and with your gear, uh, if you began to perspire when you stop, then you're very likely to freeze. I wore a wool sweater next to my skin, wool trousers, a wool shirt over the wool sweater, wool cap, wool mittens. It's the best thing to keep you from freezing. That's the wonderful thing with wool, it sort of pulls the moisture off. And so the, the most famous picture of me is drying my socks in front of the fire. Their D series was such an intense series of training in the coldest part of the winter that a lot of these guys came back and said, man, the war was easy compared to the D series. Cat light. <laughs> it was hell. <laughs> During their time at Camp Hale, the men of the 10th Mountain Division engaged in some of the most grueling training imaginable. But unlike other military units preparing for battle, inspiration came not just from the mission at hand, but also from the incredible scenery that surrounded them day and night. Well, the mountains were the magnet to start with. That was 
in our blood. And uh, the exercises and uh, uh, things that we did here did nothing but strengthen it. And there are some days, you know, it, it was so beautiful, so inviting. We just take off. Oh, we're beautiful. Those were happy days. Yeah, we thought we were never going to get in the war. <laughs> because we've been training all this time. Well, everybody, I think, was thinking, are we ever going to get in the war, or what are we going to do? In December 1944, the men of the 10th Mountain Division finally got their chance to help the Allies to victory. And all of a sudden, they were propelled into the war, and even to them, it was a little bit surprising. <laughs> Their assignment, attack and weaken the Nazi stronghold in the Apennine Mountains of Italy. But it wouldn't be easy. The Apennines were a virtual life and death obstacle course, and the German resistance would be fierce. But this was exactly the kind of mission the 10th troopers expected. And while it would be the first time most of them had ever seen combat, no military division was ever more prepared or willing to fight. We had all been trained at a much higher elevations. Our body was attuned to that type of training. So combat in Italy from a physical standpoint was not as severe as it was perhaps for other types of units. On the first patrol in January of 45, we met the enemy head on. I thought that first second or two, it was still a game. But that was my first experience, to realize that someone was trying to kill us. There was real bullets flying around, and people were dying, and camp was over. This was the real thing. These guys are down in this foxhole, bomb shells are coming down, and everybody else is digging into their foxholes. And my uncle's just running from foxhole to foxhole, making sure his guys are all right. And one guy said, man, that Kennedy is crazy, but he said it with a grin on his face, like, that guy's looking after us too. We were in a terribly battle-scarred area. So the beautiful mountains of Italy actually, during our combat action, were not very beautiful. Uh, the villages were in rubble. Everything around you was constantly decimated. Between January and May of 1945, the 10th conducted attacks on a five-mile front in the Apennines, which included the steep and rugged cliff known as Riva Ridge, and the equally challenging Mount Belvedere. There had been three prior assaults by U.S. forces on this particular region, but none of them made any impact. The night of February 19, the attacks on Mount Belvedere and Orgolesco uh, began. During that attack, my platoon sergeant was riddled through the chest with a machine gun fire, and I held him as he died, and I was furious. So I went up to where we'd set up some machine guns that were pointing at where the Germans were located, and saw where that was and came back to the platoon and said, we're going up there, and I took off up the mountain, and I took one trench that was full of Germans that had a machine gun, and they surrendered, and I went over the other side of the hill and took another one. You remember those things. It's hard to believe you shoot other people. During five months of combat, nearly 1,000 10th Mountain soldiers died in battle. One of the largest losses of life in any U.S. military division and another 4,000 10 soldiers were wounded. Even though we did brilliantly, we paid a very, very severe price for the number of months we were in battle against the Germans. Yeah, it was really basically sort of the luck as to whether you survived and the guy next to you didn't. You know, it was very, very dangerous. I mean, my dad was wounded when he was there, uh, and a lot of people that he was close to there were killed. As they were spearheading through Italy, I mean, they had been through hell and back. 
Riva Ridge, Mount Belvedere, and all these intense battles. And the war in Italy was just coming to an end. My uncle, he was in this small town and uh, there was a German gunnery outpost and they were trying to figure out how they were gonna attack it. And when they rode past it, the guy jumped up and unfortunately shot my uncle, shot him in the back. Their level of skill and capability and their level of accomplishment can best be measured perhaps by what our enemy thought of us. The senior German commander at the end of the war on the 2nd of May 1945 asked for the privilege of surrendering to our commanding general. And he said that he had been a commander on the Russian front in the north of Europe and in Italy and that the finest military unit that he had faced as a commander of German forces was the American 10th Mountain Division. Within three months after the German surrender in Italy, World War II was over. American troops headed home, and on November 30th, 1945, the 10th Mountain Division was deactivated. You know, you'd expect There'd be a whole bunch of just screaming and hollering, but really, all the guys were just kind of quiet, and, you know, trying to figure in their own mind when they get back to their families, what are they going to do? After training so hard and spending so much time in the mountains of Colorado, many of the 10th Mountain Troopers weren't ready to hang up their skis. They'd been through such an, an incredible experience so early in their life and they had come back and they knew that if they had done that there really wasn't much they couldn't do. I saw that in my barn. My sense is that as a result of his training and what he went through with the 10th both at Camp Hale and in Italy you know molded him into, into the guy that he later became which was somebody who was just afraid of nothing and knew that whatever he wanted to accomplish he could accomplish. And I think every one of those guys felt the same way. I went back to my home in Chicago, was there five months, and couldn't get back to Colorado fast enough. So I made the move like so many others. At one point, we estimated there were 400 men of the 10th who had come back to Colorado from New England or from the Midwest or from other parts of the country. We were spared in war. We came back to the mountain environment that we loved. And our entire lives from that point on, here in Colorado particularly, were around us. We could hike, we could camp, we could ski, we could enjoy what the mountains had to offer. And it changed the lives of most of us. Right? Just the mountains. The mountains. I'm sitting here above Camp Hale, and just to think that at one time there was 14,000 men that lived out in this uh, valley. From that, 8,000 skiers came to be. And through those 8,000 very passionate and fun-loving outdoorsmen was developed an entire industry. Tenth Mountain really changed nothing less than the landscape of skiing. Pre-World War II, the ski industry was very elite, and it was uh, very upper class. It, it was almost a, a sport of royalty. Americans didn't really have leisure time pre-World War II. You ask your grandparents, they worked. They didn't have leisure time. Post-World War II, there was a booming economy with the middle class newly minted with leisure time. And what happened? The ski industry actually exploded. <laughs> came home, opened it up to the masses. What they also did is they helped improve ski gear. So the army came home and they developed better ski gear for the hills. They developed nylon ropes for mountaineering. They developed sturdier boots, sturdier bindings. So the ski industry took a quantum leap in the quality of equipment because the army got involved in training troops for the hills. Today's equipment really owes a lot to those guys. And today's equipment is just unbelievable. I mean, with Shape skis, fat skis, the latest, greatest boots, the bindings that you can backcountry tour and then clap back down and ski these radical coolers. You know, it's great. 
just now the major binding companies are really starting to embrace the at gear which has even taken on a name called side country where we're going beyond the lifts beyond the ski area boundaries by hiking and descending and realistically that's what these guys were doing because of a necessity back then at camp hale and now we're doing it for recreation the list of famous 10th mountain veterans is staggering to name just a few bill bowerman co-founder of nike and creator of the waffle soul running shoe david brower former executive director and leader of the sierra club merrill hastings founder of skiing magazine paul petzel who pioneered the sport 